good afternoon everyone thank you for joining today's master class session on essential concepts of bone plating and intramedullary nailing i priyanka jain along with my colleague kritika monga from the marketing department elsevier india uh, will be moderating the session today before we start i would like to tell all the attendees here that you will not be able to unmute yourself during this session but if you have any question you can post them in the q and a tab on your screen these questions will be addressed by our speaker at the end of his presentation also please note that there will be a few mcq questions that will appear on your screen and you will be given around 30 seconds time to respond to them participation is anonymous so i i encourage all of you to submit your answers to those mcqs and now it is my honor to introduce to you our esteemed speaker of the day dr anand thakur Dr Anand has been in orthopedic practice since 1975. He received his MS ortho degree from the University of Bombay in 1970 and his MBBS degree from Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Medical College Indore in 1965. He has worked as consultant orthopedic surgeon at Cambridge Military Hospital in UK and RN Cooper Municipal General Hospital Mumbai. He has also been a professor of orthopedic surgery at GS Medical College and University of Bombay Mumbai. Currently he is into private practice in Mumbai and is involved in teaching postgraduate courses in orthopedics. He has authored three best sellers one of them being The Element of Fracture Fixation published by Elsevier and has also published a number of research papers in indexed journals. He has been the president of Bombay Orthopedic Society and he is a life member of Indian Orthopedic Association and associate overseas member of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. He is also chairman of the ethics committee at HBT Medical College and RN Cooper Municipal General Hospital Mumbai. I welcome you Dr. Anand Thakur request you to please take this session forward. Yes. This session we are going to talk about essential concepts of bone plating and intramedullary nailing when a fracture occurs the limb becomes unstable and the soft tissues are under, under distortion and movement occurs as the fracture line the limb deforms now when the soft tissues are deformed they are called in state of strain that is the technical term we use for that If we look at the fracture side uh, this is the original fracture length and by stretching or pulled out pushing there is a change in the fracture length we take these two values and then do the thing uh, do a ratio the change in the length of the fracture gap and the length and the original fracture gap that gives us a ratio that we call it as the strain this entity we use it all the time in discussing a fracture situation now strain could be in lengthening the issue or it could also be in shortening the uh, fracture side so both ways uh, the the thing is in strain and should be considered accordingly <clears throat> as it is a ratio it is expressed in percentages and there are no units whatsoever to that now we have some questions uh, that we will uh, like you to answer and then at the end of the session i will give the correct answer for all those questions um here's the first question uh, i request all the attendees to uh, please submit your response to it you have 30 seconds it of what exists relative stability absolute stability absolute stiffness total instability or strained stability maximum calcis seen well two more seconds before we end this how much difference uh, this talk has made in the understanding of this issue Uh, Dr. Anand, we have uh, gathered the responses from the participants for the first poll. Can we move to the next uh, participants? Here, I'm launching the next polling question for you. Uh, please submit your responses for this. Uh, 
Paris is coming up or not? Yes. Which component of the interfragmentary motion promotes callus formation? Simple harmonic motion, oscillating motion, axial motion, shear motion, or torsional motion? Uh, we have captured the response of the second polling as well. And I'm launching the third polling question now. Wait for the third question. Which is the highest magnitude of compression across the fracture site is created by a self compression plate, a lock plate, a Verbrugge clamp, articulated compression clamp, or a pair of both forceps. And here's the last and the fourth polling question that I'm launching. Uh, the last one uh, is select a false statement. Please select the false statement among these four. Promotes callus formation, generates interfragmentary compression, controls torsional stability, maintains length, or establishes relative stability. Which is the form false? Uh, Dr. Anand, we have captured the results of all the four polling questions now. Yes. Uh, but I believe we are going to give the answers and respond to them after the session. So thank you all the participants to give your response. Over to you, Dr. Anand. Thank you. Uh, so when a fracture occurs, uh, there is a native healing process available. And the, uh, we usually put them in a splint or a plaster. And the healing happens uh, the way it is seen in this uh, X-ray. <clears throat> the problem with such treatment is that usually there is a malunion, a deformity, muscle wasting occurs, joint stiffness occurs, and local osteoporosis due to non-function occurs. And all this together, we call it as a fracture disease. Now, internal fixation, we started doing it to avoid this fracture disease to overcome all these problems. And the main function is to get the anatomical reduction and stability so that we can move the joint and regain the function as soon as possible. This is an example. When we fix a fracture, we get healing with callus formation. And the other way is intramedullary nailing. And one sees enormous amount of callus formation. And this callus doesn't form only in the uh, outer side of uh, cortex, but also endosteal and periosteal callus is formed here. Uh, in a plating also, we see callus forming both intra and extra periosteally, endosteal and periosteal. So we like callus when it appears. The fracture heals very promptly. And we like callus. We feel victorious. We feel happy that the callus has accumulated. So <clears throat> what happens when we fix in a way that some callusine, we have established what is called as relative stability, the fixation of a fracture that allows small amounts of motion when loaded. This leads to healing of healing by callus formation. Now this relative stability in strain percentages, we see that it is between two and 10%. It's not too little, it's not too much but between two and 10% and we call that entity as a relative stability. Now, if we improve the uh, stability by enhancing uh, our technique, then sophistication of fixation of a fracture eliminates the motion uh, completely at the fracture side and it still leads to healing, but there is no stimulus to form callus and callus does not form. The end-to-end -end healing occurs, what we usually call it as primary, uh, primary healing. Perfected methods create an absolute stability and there is no motion and there is no callus. This fracture has healed very well, but there is no evidence of callus. It has healed directly from cortex to cortex because of the superior plating technique that there was no movement whatsoever at the fracture site. So this we term as a zero to two percent and absolute st absolute stability. Fixation of a fracture when loaded 
when loaded does not allow any displacement of the fracture fragment but it also prevents callus formation but allows direct bone healing which is also called primary bone healing and it's also very slow to achieve its objective so we had two situations by mechanic changing the mechanical environment of a fracture fixation is a relative stability and absolute stability in this x-ray you can see both at one go the blue arrow shows the absolute stability situation a lax screw through a plate does cause absolute stability at the fracture site there is no movement at all so the fracture has healed but you cannot see any cal any callus whatsoever the fibula was not fixed but because of vicarious stability it got a relative stability and you can see there was movement all the time and uh, a huge amount of callus has formed so his example of relative stability healing and his example of absolute stability healing both because of different mechanical environment in the same limb sometimes we fail to get any establishment in the relative or absolutely and we fix it in a way that it everything falls apart and this is called unstable situation there is high strain and whatever healing tissue occurs it breaks down immediately so tissue ruptures no healing takes place whatsoever what we have seen when our envi mechanical environment changes the amount of callus form is also different with relative stability we get huge amount of callus with absolute stability we get very little amount of fragile so we can we have always known that we need osteogenic cells and an, a scaffold on which they can grow and also we require some chemical environment or stimuli to con control the whole position this we are known for many years we have come to realize now that the mechanical environment is absolutely vital for final outcome and we as orthopedic surgeons are masters of this environment so we should concentrate on this part and make sure that we can produce a perfect mechanical environment for the situation that we are, that is in hand we like to see callus all the time why we like to see that it increases the circumference of the bone when that happens Uh, what changes is the polar and area moment of inertia this is a technical term but important it is a measure of capacity to resist twisting force and the bending force working at the fracture site so with that uh, this entity depends on this circumference of the beam that is the bone here larger the circumference stronger the beam becomes so <coughs> when with the callus formation when the there is increased circumference there is higher polar moment of inertia there is higher resistance to rotational and bending loads there is increased level of stability and now it moves from unstable to relatively stable situation abundant callus forms and we get what we desire healing of a fracture in record time so <clears throat> why we use internal fixation is to see that the healing occurs very quickly that means the callus forms so we all the time want relative stability as a necessary factor and we work towards it however there are situations where we need absolute stability what are these these are when there is a intra articular fracture we need absolute stability because cartilage doesn't stand any moment and we need that as in the when non union delayed union occurs we require again absolute stability because healing would not take place in simple diaphyseal or metaphyseal fractures uh, again absolute stability is required many times and other two conditions which is the closed vase osteotomy and when both the ends are avascular because of infection or some other reason then we require absolute stability so when we require absolute stability we should see how we are going to generate absolute stability the techniques are many one of the first one is called a lax screw technique in examination if you are ever asked by to pick up a lax screw don't even move your finger because lax screw is not a screw but it's a technique of insertion <clears throat> and it is not a screw it is the most effective way to achieve compression between the two bone fragments uh, 
how we see the lag screw efficiency that where it is located and how the insertion is taken place these are two vital concepts which are not so uh, usually discussed now here is a fracture site and we can insert a screw somewhere here or i can insert a somewhere here and i can also insert here and i'll still be able to lag it so which one should i take it as the black arrow mark this is the fulcrum of this fracture when loaded this fracture will move at this point so this is one point which we want to stabilize and along the fracture line we establish another point and the width of this violet box is the strength of fixation so at this in this position the strength of fixation is about right now we choose the position which is like this the width is so narrow so any time there is a bending load this this will not hold it will give way very easily if we shift that to the farther end the width of the box has become very wide and it is the strongest fixation intramedullary screw so if you want a really strong one you should use this position of inserting the inter, uh, internal lag screw comparison and, and the closer to the fracture side at the far end one has the minimum fixation farthest away it is at the maximum insertion however we want to have a safe position the chances are that sometimes this piece being narrow or small may break up and we could have trouble so a safe position for intermediary uh, fragmentary screw fixation is something like this this is also at 90 degrees to the fracture line and would give you a optimum fixation in greatest safety again what we need is a clear guiding hole in the near cortex and only screw should engage on the far cortex for that we have to make uh, two holes and many times we use first uh, 3.2 mm and uh, uh, cross it across and then followed by 4.5 the fallacy there is that when we insert the 4.5 our uh, the our uh, x alignment may not be same as the 3.2 and the screw hole may be a little and obliquely done and we, the gliding hole will not be as good as we require if we do the other way around make a 4.5 gliding hole first and then pass on the screw uh, drill bit the drill bit may wobble because the hole is wider and make a hole somewhere else so when we pass the screw <coughs> it may not hold very well or it may distort that so what is the correct way the correct way is first drill the 4.5 gliding hole then insert a 3.2 mm drill sleeve inside that hole and abet it to the next one and then through that you drill the hole with a 3.2 mm this way you will make the hole in the opposite cortex exactly in the center of the proximal cortex and your fixation will be perfect there will not be any uh, movement when you tighten up the screws you should remember this picture when setting up a lag screw any time it will help you in your uh, uh, so you have a gl gliding hole in the first place is a fracture to be reduced we make the gliding hole perfectly and then pass the screw here and you'll see it will make perfectly if we did not use that insert skill and our gliding hole and the distal hole is not in one line then see what happens the hole is slightly oblique and when we pass it on what happens is that the reduction it the reduction is lost it moves away from that so for a want of sleeve a reduction is lost this should not happen this is a technical error so this should not happen to you always use that 3.2 mm sleeve inside that 4.5 mm 5 mm hole and then make a perfect centralized distal hole we all use uh, fully threaded screws for making a uh, lag screw but it is likely to catch up in one or two positions and then that will cause trouble because then the full effect is not seen so ideally one should use a shaft screw which has no threads on the proximal side and only holding on the distal side that will work better and that is the best choice lag screw can be passed even through the plate and this way it it creates the most stable 
uh, fixation. There is an example, the black screw has been passed through this plate and you can see there is no callus formation whatsoever at this point. It is the strongest fixation which produces absolute stability at any time. It can also be passed bypassing the plate in the fashion that I have shown here. This is also very good and gives a stable reduction, but is not as strong as the previous example. Uh, this is a clinical example that I'm showing you here. So how do we deal with it? The lax screw dictum is a whenever a screw passes crosses a fracture line, it must be inserted as a lax screw. Secondly, a lax screw must glide freely through the near fragment and engage only in the far fragment. There should not be any catch in the near fragment, otherwise transmission of forces will not be as good. Uh, for absolute stability, insert a lag screw through a plate. That is the ultimate form of fixation. So absolute stability in diaphysis. When we have to do that, so how do we do it? If we are using a round hole plate, we can use a verbruch clamp and fix it in this way. And when we close the clamp, this, uh, stability, the, this will go into compression and we can do that. Alternately, we can use compression plate, which is, has got self-compressing holes, and we can use two screws, first compression and then undo it, and second compression, the standard procedure uh, that could be used very effectively. However, in larger bones, this method, this works very well in smaller bones, like radius and Allah, it will work wonderfully, uh, self-compression plate, you can see no, no variation here. However, in femur or tibia, sometimes it does not produce the adequate level of compression and the fracture doesn't heal. So one has to redo it and then also use a uh, lag screw to, for additional stability and the healing could happen. However, there is another way of doing it. If you want to put it in a tibia, you want to create a higher level than use a contraption called a compression clamp. It's a, called articular compression clamp, which is something like this. This hook fits into the plate and then by tightening the screw, you can compress the fracture across anyway. And a better version or version two is available, which also shows how much compression you have applied at this time. And that helps in promoting uh, adequate compression and you don't overdo it because once you reach the red zone, you don't, you stop, you don't do that. Oh, this is the arrangement we do and then we can produce absolute stability at the fracture side whenever it is required. But there are situations when we require only relative stability and most often we require relative stability. And what are these situations? The commutated fractures, diaphysial and metaphysial fractures, we require relative stability. And how do we do that? Is we like to see callus, we call it the uh, adorable or mild appearing. So we want to see a callus and the way we can do it is boosting the callus production and the way that we have to do a creative, a relative stability, a mechanical environment that will produce adequate callus. And what we really want is that the interfragmentary motion will increase. That is what we want. And the factors that modify the interfragment motion are the plate material, plate geometry, working length and the screw spacing. Now titanium has a lower modulus so it is a more flexible uh, plate and as, uh, plates made of titanium uh, produce more violin. However steel is time tested and economical and its flexibility can be modulated by changing the thickness. So really there is no choice uh, that you should only go for this or that. You can use both, but you should know what you want and what you're getting. In lower limb in such kind of situation, I personally prefer a stainless steel plate because the loads are fairly heavy and titanium somehow one feels may not be able to do the job. Uh, so in lower limb, uh, in this situation, use uh, this thing. A thin plate is more flexible than a thick plate and that's why we we can change the geometry of this plate and then generate the uh, IFM that we desire. In log plating, the, the interfragmentary motion can only happen if the plate bends because the screws will not yield anyway. So when the plate bends, then only we get interfragmentary motion when you are using a log plate, which is so very often. 
plate length is also important now we always say that use long plate because it is uh, more flexible so uh, long means how long what sort of long thing is if we plate limits on the fracture length in a comminuted fracture the ratio is 3 to 1 and a simple fracture 9 to 1 to give you an example this fracture measures 7 centimeters so we use uh, three times about 23 centimeters here and you can see a long plate has been used and the fracture has healed satisfactorily if there's a transverse fracture then we still use a long plate and the ratio is 16 to 1 uh, so adequately long plate even today this is done in 2007 today i will probably use 22 centimeter long plate so long this is the calculation what we do when we mean long plate why we do like it because it facilitates screw dispersal the plate holds stronger when the screws are separated out pull out force and the screw is reduced the two things happen the screws hold very well and the pull out screw is also uh, the force is also reduced now this is a piece of strong wood and i have applied two screws very close to each other and i'm applying a force of just small 10 mm and see what happens it breaks away so easily now in the same position i have left two screws a longer screw farther a longer plate and farther away i applied and i'm applying a plate of almost five times that and very little has given way simply by increasing the plate length to the attachment we have increased the, the holding power of the plate same thing we do in the bone and if a thing like this will give away so easily, but in 15 nitron, well, widely separated screws, nothing will happen. So, longer the plate uses higher stability. Now, working length is the distance between the two innermost locking screws that dominate the bending screw. If these screws are very close, the uh, the movement, the flexibility reduces if the screws are farther away the flexibility increases now this distance is called working length in plate which you all probably know by now the longer working length higher the flexibility and the higher the flexibility the more the interfragmentary motion so we want to have a plate with a longer um, working length so that we get maximum interfragmentary uh, moment but there are no guidelines which tell us what to do with it so how do we do about it with it uh, how do we go about it now this uh, this working length we have kept a 30 mil 4 mil but these are only arbitrary if you were not actual measurement so this is the fracture line the screws are separated occupying the two innermost thing and we say the working length is 34 for example and we get a certain kind of interfragmentary motion we have now left one screw and increase the working length or distance between the two closest screws to 70 millimeter our interfragmentary motion has gone further up so we increase it further and it really goes through the roof now this is a very good idea we would say okay go on expressing use only terminal screws and it happens but life is not that simple there are three components of interfragmental screw they are shear fear and shear axial and torsion now shear and torsion movements will inhibit callus formation so these two shear and torsional movements are counterproductive and we do not want them we only want the axial movement which will stimulate callus formation and this is limited these two increase in exponential only axial motion promotes callus formation that is the important thing we should know so if we go on increasing the working length the shear force or shear motion increases disproportionately and which against which for, works against uh, callus formation and which is detrimental to our healing so we cannot go on increasing all the time what we have worked out or uh, found out with experience that two empty holes on either side of the fracture line will give us the longest working length that will give us a useful interfragmentary screw so optimally we leave two holes on either side of the fraction line here is the fraction line and we have left two screws on either side 
and what we can show in good time everything healed very well without any problem it adequate ifm and healing occurred without any issue <clears throat> however in this case the working leg was too high and the result was not very likable so disadvantage of working leg is that there is increased strain on the screw bone interfaces if we increase it too much there is damaging forces what you call as strain at the screw bone interfaces and this is not only at the proximal cortex but also on the distal cortex all these red markers on the near cortex they are the loosening bad forces but there are also some bad forces on the opposite cortex so if we increase the working leg too much these will destroy our fixation we don't want that so how we are going to go there we can do it by <coughs> to prevent that we do what is called as screw spacing it's a new concept that the distance between the first two screws closest to the fracture site on either side of the fracture is the screw space like the distance between the blue and the red halo on each side is the screw spacing so we take exam the manage the screw space to reduce the strain levels so that our fixation will last for a longer time now we are, what we have done here is that we kept the working leg maximum and the two holes on either side we are left open for working leg. and then we are occupied number 3 4 holes and then number 9 hole which is the last hole which we always want to occupy so we are left no after two working lengths we are left first one and then we go on there so our spacing is 3 4 and 9 and we get the uh, strain levels at like this again these numbers are arbitrary it's just for demonstration purpose we get high like 1158 100 500 and now we change the screw spacing to 3 5 and 9 that means we are left a gap here and there is a space between the third and fourth screw the third and five hole we have occupied so there is a drop in the uh, disturbing forces and which is a very satisfactory issue we we become adventurous and we said okay we'll leave two screws so we are 3 6 and 9 3 6 and 9 and you can see the forces are really dropped further so we said okay let's try one more thing but now the forces are going up there and it's becoming unstable so that is not the good idea so optimal screw spacing is 3 6 and 9 that means after the working length you occupy the first screw then leave a gap of two screws and then occupy the third second screw and you will get the optimum uh, screw spacing that will hold your fixation maximum two empty holes after first screw will reduce the risk of loosening <coughs> so to compare if we leave two empty holes on either side of the fracture we get maximum ifm and if we say uh, leave two spaces of two empty holes we get minimum stresses so this is the ideal combination maximum working length and maximum holding power and that way we will be very happy so these two articles i would strongly recommend that everybody should read they are very tough articles to understand but i have simplified that in this book and to make it easier to understand i added several original diagrams that will help you in this way <clears throat> the factors that modulate interfragmentary motion are titanium and stainless steel plates plant length and plate thicknesses and working length and screw spacing once you consider all this we should be able to control the desirable interfragmentary motion to give the best results in plating now we'll move on to what happens in intramedullary nail intramedullary nail works on a different principle it's an internal splint and works as a splintage splintage is a fixation in which there is sliding movement between the implant and the bone <coughs> this provides relative stability and and some movement always persists at a fracture site which is desirable because it produces callus however nailing does not produce interfragmentary compression nailing does not generate intercompressive compression it is important to know there is no mechanism we can generate that so what is the purpose of nailing is that to maintain the line and length to uh, pre prevent translation and prevent the rotational distresses 
the transmission of axial forces uh, axial force is the main leading force how is transferred from one end to the other end it is by a contract at the entry point in the medullary canal and at the distal cancellous epiphysis now you have the entry point we have a contract here one uh, fixation point then at the cortical contact and then distal mesophysis so you have got three point because of friction it also gives you some degree of rotational stability but only of a minor nature so three point fixation is the principle on which a nailing mechanism works the <coughs> interlocking screw we use interlock is called intra interlock made intramedullary screw they are only as supplementary fixation devices we get various types and we can pass them at various lights what these do is is they just control rotation they have nothing to do with axial stability that means they do not help in transmitting the forces from proximal to distal fragment if the nail bone contact does not occur in the in the medulla then the locking screws take all the load and bend if there is a poor nailing then the uh, locking screws will bend the core diameter of the screw is important if it is thicker the better and purchase on both cortex is also desirable one should you never do a hammer a screw while interlocking you can see here there is a screw with uh, which is fairly thick in the uh, center part and has got lock uh, threads on either side so it can get locked so it should have purchased in the uh, distal cortex this is a kind of ideal screw shaft that you can see now we can get the fixed angle interlocking oh, this is a screw which has got three different diameters and a sleeve of the absorbable material is put on it and as you tighten it it gets locked here and prevents any kind of toggling uh, during the healing process these screws are commercially available and can be used uh, they are more advantageous than normal bolts that we use interlocking screws will will uh, will restrict the rotational will give you rotational stability and will also maintain the bone length absolute stability in nailing is not possible and relative stability in nailing can be attained only by diligence you can't just pass a screw uh, pass a nail and expect it to heal as you know unstable nailing, nailing is a very common place here is an example fairly straight forward fracture the way it has been nailed there is no hole proximally there is no hole distally and there's just about enough cortical thing here obviously this did not do very well nail creates only relative stability locking screws maintain only length and rotation locking screws do not provide axial stability now working length is a term we use here uh, in nailing also and it is uh, is of two types we measure it against the torsional loads and against the bending load torsional loads the working length extends from the locked the locking screw itself the length of the locking screw is the working length it does not decrease in between so this is the working length in torsional load but when it comes to <coughs> locking screws do not cortical contact bending load provides necessary stability and so much now axial loading which is a major load transfer is by contact the nail usually has a contact proximally and distally and when it is loaded what happens it bends and when it bends it touches the cortex at both proximal and distally and establish a third point of contact now we have the proximal contact the middle contact and distal contact when this situation is created then only we get axial stability against the axial loading if this does not happen all the load is taken by these screws they bend and nailing invariably fails to do achieve its other thing so the working length uh, of in bending load is not related to the screws that we fix but depends on where the nail makes a contact with the bone that is the most important part so these are two different things and we should uh, when a limb is loaded a nail bends and comes in contact with the cortex the cortical bone takes up the load only this way stability against bending load is possible not by interlocking but
putting adequately thick nail which will produce three point contact so three point fixation is your ideal target and you should achieve that <coughs> working length is a term we use in nail and plates but if you try to compare this and that there could be lot of confusion because they are like apples and oranges so best is at student stage uh, or early uh, thing just to take them separately so the terminology is same but the, you should understand them in a different format we always uh, take to reaming uh, because reaming smoothens the medullary cavity also enlarges it once that happens then uh, this is uh, usually the normal cavity is something like this but after nailing we are able to uh, produce a better larger one and we are able to create a larger contact and a larger area can uh, make contact with bone so thicker nail can be easily passed and that will give a more stability like a tube and tube stability and thicker nail is advantageous for higher movement of inertia that i was talked to you earlier now thicker nail is strong against bending load and also because it touches at many points it offers better resistance to torsional load as well so always try and use a thicker nail in this thing this is making good contact here and that will work very well so successful for success you should have a three point fixation which you can see on all these positions and then then <clears throat> here you can see this fixation all these three point even when you do multiple striking wires you can create a three point fixation like it's you can see in here unless you have created three point fixation you will not be able to get a stability which will produce healing in the fracture site so always try for that even even in radius and nailing you should have this three point fixation principle working on that so that brings us to end of my presentation this is my email address if you have any questions or any difficulties in future you can write to me and i will be very happy to answer you uh, when it time that's here the lecture provides us only with a fleeting opportunity to make our point i had tried to bring out as much as in the time permissible but you need to do more reading and a good resource is already available to you through uh, the publishers and you should make a good use of it now before we take your questions i want to repeat those uh, multiple choice questions uh, and then i this time i will tell you the answers can we have those uh, multiple choice questions again yes dr anand so i will uh, launch the polling again one by one is it possible for you to give us the prior first reading also or no uh yes so uh, let me first share the results uh, yeah. uh, what we received earlier and then i will launch the pol polling again so first majority 46% have said that it is relative stability yes that's fine we'll see how many have changed their mind after listening to the lecture maximum calysis seen in relative stability that is the choice of the maximum people then maximum calysis in the state of relative stability now this is uh, i have relaunched the polling so everyone can uh, yes, you can vote now please vote again uh which state you think will produce the maximum callus relative absolute total strain whatever choice <clears throat> dr anand should i uh, share the result of this poll yes yes please do oh we have converted a lot of people earlier it was only 44% now it is 90% so i am glad everybody paid attention and uh, some benefit has been drawn to it so can you have the second question yeah so i will first uh, i'm first sharing yeah. the result of the previous polling yeah so this is the result Uh, so we had 30% that is the maximum number that uh, that is the axial motion 
will produce the um, maximum entry motion, maximum axial component. Yes, let's have the new poll. Whether thirty percent has gone down or up, let's see. There is nothing like simple harmonic motion or oscillating motion in the fracture. I just put it as a trap question or a misleading answer. Never there is simple harmonic motion in fracture side. So which component of the interfragmentary motion promotes callus formation? This is the new result. Okay, again, eighty-eight percent. Wonderful. Very nice. I'm happy. Uh, very few have uh, gone the other way. That's very nice. Uh, very time well spent by both of us, you and me. <laughs> I'm sharing the result of the third polling now. Articulated compression cam is the popular answer, uh, but we have. Reasonable uh, answers on self dog one uh, bush clamp. Uh, okay, fine. So let's see. Articulated compression clamp is the one. And where do we go from there? Yes, magnet of compression across a fracture site is. This, and this is the new result. Oh, I think I had to make harder effort because conversion rate is very low, seventy-two. I can't accept that. Uh, when you the high highest level of our uh, compression can be created only by articulated compression clamp. In fact, the uh, when the locking. All the self compression plates came into being, and the locking plates come into being. The majority of surgeons gave up using the art. So newer papers are coming in, uh, describing that we are not able to generate enough compression across the fracture site in long, bigger bones like femur, tibia, or. So these days, I always advocate that. One of these three bones, if you are trying, try and use uh, the com articulated compression clamp in addition to the uh, the mechanism in the uh, self compression plate, and that two together you will make a better fixation and will have more success. So this need the articulated compression clamp needs to be repopularized among the young surgeons because for Almost ten years, it is not being in circulation. In fact, in my hospital, when I said, uh, "Please send me a photograph of that," they had to search where that clamp is lying down. So let that thing not happen in your hospital. Start using it right away and make better, uh, better uh, results for your patient. Uh, the last question, madam. So, sir, this is the previous result. Okay. Uh, then the, we have to select the false. So the maximum people have said that it does not generate interfragmentary compression. Thirty-two percent have said. Let us see what is the conversion rate here. Please select the false statement in this. Whether it promotes, or it generates, or controls, maintains, establishes. Which is the false statement in this? And the new result? Uh, yes, that's very good. Seventy-eight percent are now converted and identified that whatever happens, interfragment. Uh, Intramedullary nailing cannot generate interfragmentary compression. So that's very good conversion rate, and I'm very happy that uh, message that I wanted to put across has really gone through. 
and uh, now if there are any questions we can take up uh, uh so sir if you uh, look at the q and a tab here we have just nine questions there i think you can directly read from there itself do you see the questions in the list sir yeah i can see the is strain expressed in negative when it occurs in case of shortening no no it is not negative or positive the percentage so uh, if it is uh, it's not uh, it's not uh, done in negative any time uh, it's only in percentage original and it has reduced so you can say it has reduced to that many percent but there is no negative value what is the benefit of gliding hole instead of a threaded hole uh, if there are if proximal cortex and distal cortex both are threaded then the two pieces of the bone will not come together because both the threads move together and there will not be any compression so if you want to compress the two fragments together then it should not have any hold in the proximal uh, fragment and if you have a threaded hole in the proximal uh, cortex then it will not hold that so you must have a gliding hole a threaded hole will not work then it will work only as a placement screw and will not give you the uh, required effect of compression um, how is it possible to remove, how is it possible to remove all those screws yeah it is possible i mean that itself is a big topic how to remove screws after the job is done it is possible to remove everything uh, that's a special technique and that will require a longer session almost the double the session to tell you all about how to remove screws from implant but it is possible there is a question what happens if you increase the number of screws used number if you use number of screws it is futile uh, if in a plating if you use number if you use three screws then you have made safe it against the bending load and if you use four screws on either side of a fracture in a plate then you have made it safe against the rotational forces more than that it has no meaning they just add in number and they increase the stiffness of the plate so the plate does not does not remain flexible and may break easily so we do not want to use uh, screws which are useless we always use one fair closest to the fracture site a uh, one at the farthest end of the plate and the two in between uh, it matters only uh, according to the screw placement that i have just discussed with you this is a very new item and uh, you should uh, know that very well if you leave two spaces after the first screw and then use the other screw then you are making it safe there will be less strains at the proximal and distal cortex and your plating would go on for longer so long and short for this uh, increase in number of uh, it's a wasteful activity and what is wasteful we do not do we do it with minimum work so that's fine what will happen if there are multiple fracture points on the same bone how will it affect screw spacing the multiple fractures when we use a very long plate uh, which will have which will go from one end to another this is classical in uh, in uh, alna uh, if there are two or three fractures we use a long plate which is span the whole thing and then in between we may not use any screw whatsoever we may just use two and two on the other side and maybe a circlage in between or just realign them and leave it there or maybe just depends on exact situation but uh, we will not use two or three different plates when there are multiple fracture points we we'll use a one long plate which will span the entire length of the bone and we'll fix it from there <clears throat> is that all the questions that i can see uh, so we have one more minute so if you can uh, take one or two more questions from the list yeah i can but i don't put them here anymore oh uh, i got rahul sarkar as the last one uh, can you just close and open it again because there are students who have given more questions okay. okay you want me to read from the screen is it i will 
okay rahul sarkar is gone uh, what is the ideal thickness of intramedullary nail in indian circumstances is usually 11 to 12 mm in european circumstances where people are stronger uh, 13 mm is taken as uh, is ideal because beyond that uh, the it doesn't help in uh, stabilizing that unnecessarily increase the medullary cavity so in our circumstances 11 is the ideal plus minus 1 and if you are going to work in europe then i would think you should target for 13 plus minus 1 is there any advantage of intramedullary wires to the nail uh, no no not much uh, except when you are wire say in humerus then your insertion points are very small but with even nails the your insertion point is very very small uh, it is uh, your personal technique or availability of the instruments uh, the multiple wire uh, nailing or bunch nailing was a earlier description before we didn't have proper uh, nails that we have today it became into practice uh, you pass several wires right uh, as a bouquet and spread them out Uh, but there is no advantage to that it's a different technique but worth knowing and when if you don't have proper nail it's good to do a proper wiring nail uh, it's a te- everybody should learn as many techniques as possible so that you get the best uh, armament and as the situation, ar- situation arises you can rise to the occasion and make the best thing for your patient is emphasis importance of prebending of a plate prebending of a plate when you are applying a plate to a transverse fracture uh, if you do not prebend and apply tension then the distal cortex will open up there will be a small gap the proximal cortex where the plate is will be under great compression but the distal cortex will open up to prevent that you should prebend the plate just opposite the fracture line earlier we used to say make a sharp bend but now we say make a roundish bend a smooth bend there of a few millimeters uh, maybe 1 or 2 mm and then apply it but when you are applying pre bend plate to a transverse fracture you must start applying the screws from the center of the plate towards the periphery i repeat pre bending plate when you want to apply it to say femur or humerus up start applying the screws from the middle from the center closest to the fracture line and go towards the periphery because as you go on the plate starts expanding or straightening it out and will do the adequate job if you fix the dis- farther more screws first the plate will not be able to expand or straighten out and you will not achieve your objection so that is the pre bending plate how would i address plating of segmental fractures i just said that you have to use a very long plate which will encompass two or three fracture fragments and you can um, fix them up can you please tell about the three point contact nail yes uh, i gave several examples but i'll repeat the point of entry is the first contact point then the contact in the diaphysis is the second contact point and contact in the distal metaphysis is the third contact point you have to strive to get all these three contact points correctly that means your entry point should be precise and in a good bone so that the nail does not wobble there it should also go and penetrate the distal metaphysis for an example tb are fairly close to the plafond so it has a base there straightens there and it should be big enough so when loaded it will touch the cortex or contact point and reduce the working length to a suitable level do not depend on locking screws the interlocking screws for stability axial stability is not given by interlocking screws they are ancillary fixations the main fixation is a nail of adequate thickness we should ex- go from proximal to distal fragment uh three so point we, um, yeah, you want to meet stop <laughs> actually we keep on uh, we see that there is a rise in the number of questions so maybe if you can just take one last question before we wrap up okay sure 
which screws are best 14 tpi or 20 tpi uh, i think the commonly used is 20 tpi but 14 tpi is for another use if you have got the cancel screw where we don't want to where the bone material is sparse we don't have very uh, we don't want a very strong compression we'll use something like 14 tpi which is in cancellous area 20 tpi is fairly close and in the cortical areas you want a strong compression a stronger hold so there we will use 20 tpi and uh, this is technical but very important to know but when you choose you ask for a cortical screw you really don't care whether it's 20 or 22 but uh, as a surgeon you must know and this is the difference for cancellous 14 and for cortical 20 uh you want to take one more principles of plating do you follow the intra articular fracture uh, this yes. one is long answer <laughs> okay uh, does that doesn't the muscles get damaged yeah of course they get damaged so if you don't take care for them all our incisions are so carefully planned that if you follow these steps you will cause minimum damage to the muscle so before every surgery every time should read your incisions very carefully even now when i go for operation i read my incisions religiously before going in maybe i had done that operation n number of times but still i will read it because some while some parent there i do it for safety of the patient so you know your incisions right they have all been worked out so well that you will not damage any muscle and you must be careful not to damage them by by a rough surgery <coughs> uh no, and i can go on but uh, <laughs> what you can you can assure them we'll answer all these questions by yes. in writing in yes doctor two, three days i will do that uh, religiously there is no problem and yes, those so who have my email id they can send me questions time and uh, if not immediately but within a short time i will answer uh, uh, no problem there yes thank you dr anand so uh, all the questions that are uh, unanswered right now uh, i will make sure i'll send these uh, questions to the speaker dr anand thakur and within a few days uh, we will send them back to you uh, along with the certificate and the recording of this session sir any last parting words be, uh, that you would want to say to the audience yes i would say that you must know all the implants you must know how to put a plate properly how must put a nail properly you must know how to do reduction particularly in the hip all the reduces you should know very very carefully don't go guys at early stage or at any stage saying that i am only nailer i don't like plate or i am only plater i will not like nail that is a bad situation for you that is a bad situation for the uh, patient the implants are as good as the surgeon who uses them they can all implants can produce fantastic results provided the surgeon knows how to use them so my plea to him for my two years you must master technique of all the possible implants that we are described or that are in use and then use them selectively as required for the case in hand and not because you have it in your arm or you fancy this or some other reason use the correct implant for the correct situation that way you will be happy and your patient will be happy no implant is good and bad but it is as good and bad as the user so be a very good user and be a successful surgeon Bye thank for you, now. Doctor. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Anand. Thank you very much for taking up this session, giving us your time, and I'm sure all the information that you have shared with the attendees here is going to benefit them uh, in their uh, practice. Uh, with this, uh, on behalf of Elzevir, I thank you, Dr. Anand, and I thank all the participants here. As I said, a recording of this session and certificate of participation will be shared with you in a few days, and we will also share the answers of the questions that remain today. Uh, please stay tuned to the social media of Elzevir India for more uh, such interesting masterclass sessions. Enjoy the evening. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>